It's a messy process for me, you know. It's never a, a, a straight line to the goal. Get away from sounds that are overused. When you're under time pressure, it's a little bit like somebody saying to you, be spontaneous. It doesn't work. Usually I start with trying to wrap my head around the story or what is the story of the project? Is it a film or, or a series? Whatever it is, it has a story and you get a script or you get a rough cut or you, you get some sort of an idea. What is the story about and how is the story set? Um, for the historical, geographical circumstances, etc. And it all gives you a, a, a feel for what are the possibilities for sound or what sound might work with this. Now, I've been to, you know, there are usually spotting sessions before every project where you go through the film or the, the episode and you discuss it with the director or showrunner and you come up with a music plan. And I have to put this caveat in here and say quite often these plans are not followed. You know, quite often you make a perfect plan and then you start to work on the music and you go, it's all wrong, I have to do this different. And it's similar with sound design, you know, every story you start with a few ideas and um, you want to put a few sounds together and sort your palette, so to speak. And uh, it is quite important these days, I find, um, to start when you're making the sounds or customizing the sounds for the project to try to get away from sounds that are overused for the simple fact that there's a lot of very good sounding uh, sources out there and a lot of composers are using the same sources. So everybody starts sounding a little bit alike. So one way to get away from that is that at the source you're already customizing your sound. So I think sound design is already part of the, the writing process and thus very important for me. However, this being said, I've had quite a few projects where I went through a whole sorting out sound process and then I started working on the project and I dismissed it all and started over and started with a different sound palette. So, um, and in that it's just like writing in that you have an idea for a melody or a part that you think is going to work really well but only when you are actually working to picture and um, have reviewed it a few times will you will you know for sure. But I think it's all one creative process and the first step after learning about the story and learning about the project for me is usually to uh, put some customized sound um, selections together and it's kind of like uh, you know, preparing the ground a little bit for you for for what you're gonna do in writing, and the better that sound palette is, the more inspired you are in the morning to come in and and start writing. So it's 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 multiple perspectives, but uh, you know, with this one aspect of it to say you can't be tied to your sound palette too much because in the creative process it always needs to be possible to change course if the project leads you down that way. You know, the beautiful thing for me is that you can customize your studio setup per project. And I do this on a, on a regular basis and, you know, there are uh, different composers handle templates differently. Some have thousands of tracks and some want to start with one track. And I'm somewhere in the middle where I have sort of a generalized template that I update, but then I customize a template per project. And that is uh, then sort of A, it limits a little, so I don't have thousands of tracks, but it's also customized sound selections and edits. Um, and that's not just at source, so putting a filter on it or, or an envelope, um, but quite often involving effects settings and effects chains that then become part of a sound. Uh, say as an example, you know, um, pianos for me, one of the most overused instruments ever. So the, the way to use a piano for me, I've come to find, is either to use it completely dry and upfront with, with no effects treatments whatsoever, and you need a 
very good sample source to, to get away with that, unless you record direct. Or to put it into massive amounts of reverb and effects that actually, high, in the end, almost hide the source once you distort and, and uh, uh, stylize it to the point where it's not really recognizable as a piano, it becomes something else. But it can then become part of your template, and that's just the sound that you use in the context of this project, and it's defined as such, but made from five different aspects. Well, every instrument has a little bit of a personality, you know, and over the years, of course, they're sort of like old friends, and, and uh, some of it, I think, is also coincidence, honestly, you know, where you say, I haven't worked with this for a while, I'd, I'd like to work with it again. Some of it is just experience or, or knowledge. Um, you know, as an, a very simple example, uh, new technology typically works more reliable and you can do more things with it. Um, old technology is typically less reliable and you can do less things with it. But if I have a need for something that is in character unpredictable, the old piece of equipment is much more likely to give me some usable material than something that's completely reliable and predictable. So there's different assessments for which instruments to use, and I usually keep a little bit of both. Some newer instruments, but also some older instruments, like the Memory MOOC, that are famously unstable and never produce the same thing twice. Now, if I'm Dependent on that, that's not a good thing. You know, if I want to recall a session, I wouldn't rely on that instrument. But if I'm just collecting sounds that are supposed to be weird, strange, and unpredictable, it's a perfect instrument. You know, and in that case, we, we do sampling sessions, recording sessions with that instrument, record everything, and then I will just edit and select the, the bits that fit best in the process. In general, you know, my composition process is an assembly process more than a traditional writing process where you start with a melody and then you arrange around it. For me, it's always finding different bits that I think fit into a, a, a context, arranging them, playing with them, finding certain balances, and then, you know, start over the next day, reassess and then eventually work towards something that I find effective against picture or whatever the circumstance is. But it's a messy process for me, you know, it's never a, a, a straight line to the goal. I have a strange relationship to classical orchestra um, because I grew up with that sound. Um, you know, in my family, um, there was a lot of exposure to classical music and so I've always, I think I've, I have the sound or the aesthetic of the sound somewhere ingrained in me. Um, at the same time, when I grew up, I, I studied classical music, but never loved it. I, I loved playing in bands and being in studios and going on tour. That's, that's what I loved doing. And that's what I eventually ended up doing with Tangerine Dream. And then sort of in a long circle came back to classical music with film scoring, where sometimes I, I wanted to do some orchestra. But when I approach orchestra, I approach it as an element in this assembly process that I talked about. And, and therefore, just another instrument or just another color or just another group uh, that has to fit sort of an overall architecture that I have in mind. And the, all of this architecture in nature is, is experimental, which means sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And the problem with orchestra is that it's quite expensive to produce <laughs> or to record. And, uh, you know, you can't afford to experiment too much with it, which is where, you know, sampling libraries come into play for me because they allow me to experiment as much as I'd like to and then make a decision later on and say, yeah, this is actually something I can only achieve in a digital um, frame, or it's actually something that would benefit from either partial or complete replacement with an actual recording. So it's all, to me, this has to stay kind of an open process, but I do think deep inside, like how I assess strings, or what's a good string sound for me, 
still goes back to what I grew up with, you know, and, and there, there's something that connects there and, and that makes me kind of one-sided a little bit and, and probably dismiss a lot of other string aesthetics to something that I'm just most familiar with or where, for me, the comfort zone is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of sort of the effects chain that then goes on everything and that will be your glue for the whole thing because I think that's again one step in making everything sound a little bit the same and I see a lot of compose in the old days you know we recorded into Pro Tools and you always had the same reverbs up to me it sort of limits a little bit what you can do with um, um, with effects treatments as I see them as part of the creative decision process right so in my templates, I'm keeping it pretty open, what I'm doing with effects. And the beauty, again, of this type of setup is that per piece, you can recall a completely different effects chain. Um, and I quite frequently do. There has to be some glue in the project, you know, and in, uh, in what you're writing. But I generally resist doing that with um, the typical treatments, which is, you know, mostly reverb um, and, um, and some mastering aspects also. I, I kind of like to have the option and then pretty much like a, uh, the example with the piano, to be able to go radical, to either go completely dry or to go overdo effects to a point where it becomes a completely different sound. And um, I, I haven't found sort of a, a, a reverb or something else that had so much character that I then went, okay, I want this to be the unifying element for this project. Not yet. Maybe I will one day, you know, and I'll, I'll find the Brickhouse T2 <laughs> and it'll sound so amazing that that's going to define a project, but it, it, it hasn't so far. I found a while ago that if I um, only write directly for picture, um, it seemed to me that things were getting a little bit one-sided. And I had all these examples in mind <clears throat> of music that was written before the picture. And then picture was either shot to music or adapted to music and, and quite a few of them work extremely well. And it made me think if that shouldn't be m more of a process that you use sometimes. And so I started a few years ago to go into work phases where I would just pre-write music or, or jot down ideas and develop idea catalogs. And so when I approach a project and I'm under time stress, I usually do a bit of both. Sometimes you just have an idea and you want to try this idea against picture and you just go for it. Um, but if you don't have that specific idea, I usually go to these idea catalogs, which are basically very simple captures of a certain musical thought. And I throw them against picture and I get a sense with picture, where do I find the most resonance? And then I either take that, that I, one will emerge that we go like that, just works the best. And then I can either take that and develop it further, or I can just say, okay, that's a great idea. I'm going to start over, but I have this external element that's already in place that I'm basing this on. And it has helped me. I don't know if it works for other people, but it has helped me to open up the process of finding ideas and managing ideas a little bit. Because I, you know, I think the underlying realization for me was is that you can't make ideas happen. You know, like if somebody says, no, you have an idea now, it doesn't work this way. And it's a little bit like this with writing uh, music for a picture. When you're under time pressure, it's a little bit like somebody saying to you, be spontaneous. 
it doesn't work, you know? And so in those moments, if you don't have that idea right there at that moment, it's actually good to have sort of uh, your own phone book of ideas that you can go through. And this technology, or specifically Media Bay in Cubase, helps a lot because you can manage quite effectively hundreds and hundreds of ideas and just go through them and try them real quick against picture. And it'll give you some sort of a, if nothing else, it gives you an idea what doesn't work. But in most cases, it actually gives me sort of a, a starting point where I go like, I think this combination of elements, this type of sound with some production ideas could actually work in this context. And so that's, that's how it usually starts.